Defense Minister Peter Dutton urged Australia to prepare for war. What do you think is behind all this war talk? Thanks, Manure. Well, um, there are a few things behind this. So, like, the most obvious and immediate one is that we're in the middle of a federal election campaign and the Liberal Party is a little bit worried about their prospects of forming government in the next term and uh, the way that Conservative parties often do. They like to beat the drums for war to get support. There's, uh, they believe that there's this uh, latent sort of nationalist fervour out there in the community and uh, you know once they identify some kind of common threat people will rally behind the flag and support their draconian policies. Um, I really don't think that it's actually going to work very much this time. I think that uh, society is very different to how it was a few decades ago. And, uh, and things like the Iraq war just show that there is actually a massive anti-war sentiment out there. So I, I really doubt whether it'll be effective in this way. But even apart from that, uh, there is a massive um, benefit to capitalism and uh, you know, government uh, funded corporations and industry arms industry lobbyists for a drive to war because it justifies massive government expansion of funding for military contractors and uh, arms uh, manufacturers and uh, you know research into this but also war is a racket and it just allows money to be funneled through society to basically anyone who knows how to pick it up and like that goes to Australian contractors but also overseas and American contractors and there's a lot of there are a lot of corporations and individuals individuals out there who will gain from massive expansion of uh, government money in the area and I, I do definitely think that there is there's a lot to be gained for conservative reactionary politics in the drumbeat for war uh, and it's not just the money and the contracts but like people remember the Cold War and they remember how that justified a very repressive state in even in so-called like a democratic system which is supposed to be the, the you know the the opposite of the the Soviet authoritarianism they cracked down on unionists and uh, left-wing poli uh, political movements all in the name of the the Cold War the fight against communism and they absolutely Peter Dutton and everybody on his side of politics would absolutely love to have another excuse to engineer a repressive state in the same way that it was decades ago. Um, so like, it's, all, it's all upsides for them and it's absolutely all downsides for everyone else. So this is a major reason why we have to oppose all talk of war. And even, even if it doesn't lead to war, the pathway that they're taking us on has to be resisted. Deputy Prime Minister Ban Mee Joyce claimed that the Solomon Island China Pact might mean Australia could have a little Cuba on our doorstep. What are your thoughts on this? I think that is a, that's a very convenient analogy for him to make. Like as I was saying before, they uh, the, they they they're salivating over the Cold War and having Cuba, which had their uh, socialist revolution, or well, their revolution in 1959 wasn't yet socialist, but it was a an independence revolution uh, that freaked out America, and you know, like it did lead to things like the um, uh, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. But like, it, we, when we hear about this um, the the Cuban Missile Crisis, we only ever hear it from uh, U.S. propaganda from their side, and it's ignored the fact that um, there were American missiles pointing at the Soviet Union stationed in Turkey. Like, it, what, what uh, the Soviet Union was doing by stationing missiles in Cuba was like, it, it's exactly the same as that situation. Um, but it's also very instructive of the fact that Cuba absolutely posed no threat to America. Um, like, the, the existence of the revolution and the fact that they were a socialist society in the Caribbean that Americans were under absolutely no danger from that. Uh, and I think that Barnaby Joyce describing the Solomon Islands as comparable to Cuba, maybe it's, it's more, you know, there's an element of that which, which we can learn from, which is that, like, America never suffered anything from Cuba being on the doorstep. And I really don't think that 
anything will happen to Australia from this uh, Chinese uh, security pact that they've they've done with the Solomon Islands. It's like it's very inconvenient for the government that it happened to happen during the election because they wanted to talk about national security as an election um, talking point. Uh, but uh, but really, it's it's they're they're also using it as a a reason to stir up fearfulness in the community, and we have to fight back against that. There's we we have no beef with the Solomon Islands. They're a tiny country, and uh, you know, we should let them decide what they want to do for their own security. What sort of neighbour has Australia been in the Pacific? This is a very good question because it's something that Australians never seem to talk about. But Australia has actually been a shocking regional power in the Pacific. Like, I know that a lot of people on the left and elsewhere uh, really feel that we're the lap dog, lap dog of America and that we just do what they say, we're kicked around. But actually, we're, we're a little bully in ourselves. And there are so many examples of how we've behaved appallingly. Um, you know, like um, there's the conflict in Bougainville, an independence movement from PNG in which we flooded the country with arms in order to defend a, a gigantic open cut mine there. Um, you know, that was run by Rio Tinto, and uh, yeah, and we, we've we've supported coups in Fiji and other areas, um, just completely steamrolling whatever the local government or you know, local people might want for themselves self-determination. No, if it's not in Australia's interest, we'll overthrow the government and install our own. And the Solomon Islands is so obviously a site of intense Australian meddling. It's in 2003, there was the, uh, the I think it's called the Rams, Rams are um, uh, like military operation or police operation, which came in and basically replaced the Solomon Islands um, security forces with our own and implemented an entire bureaucracy of Australians. We used up our, our aid budget to do this and all, basically reshaped this, the entire Solomon Islands, um, uh, their system of government and their, um, the way that they manage their resources in Australia's interests. And yeah, we like Australian police force was quite repressive in their putting down of, of local activists and movements that were fighting for um, sustainable logging and uh, you know and fishing, and, and yeah, we decided uh, with capitalism and capitalist interests and implemented some private prisons that Australians made money out of that uh, locked up uh, a lot of uh, people in the Solomon Islands and yeah, and and we treated them like as. Like a, like a colonial power would treat a colony. And it doesn't surprise me at all that, that their government has decided that actually they're not benefiting much from uh, a cooperation with Australia and they need to look elsewhere for, for support. You know, like it, it makes absolute sense. And the fact that the government was caught by surprise by this, you know, really shows how tinier they are and how they just don't listen to people in the Solomon Islands. Obviously, China is, you know, like, I mean, they may not be as ascendant as some people claim, but uh, they're a big power in the region. And we, the, the switch that's been, that's happened in Australia in the last couple of years, where we've decided that they're this big enemy that we've got to build up huge military resources to counter, is, it's come from nowhere. And it's absolutely false. There's no evidence for this, that they're not, trying to cause any disruption to us that, that we know of. They're like we, we have to be realistic about the region and about what China's interests are. So instead of expending huge amounts of money on vastly increasing the uh, military budgets, we should think about how we can actually help uh, the, the societies that are in the Pacific, in our region, uh, cope with like a, a multipolar world and majorly, in particular, climate change. Australia has actually been completely negligent in ignoring the pleas of Pacific Island countries that we take climate change seriously because they, more than anybody else, will be absolutely obliterated by 
rising sea levels. And we've just completely ignored that. So like even a fraction of the money that's going to militarism needs to be dedicated towards dealing with climate change and working with the communities of these island nations to help them prepare for what's coming, what's inevitable. So like, I think that that's the number one priority. And also uh, there's a, there are um, national liberation movements within the Pacific and I think we should support them. Like, uh, for instance, Bougainville recently voted in a referendum for independence. We should support that. And a lot of the resources that are currently going to the arms industry and militarism need to be dedicated towards helping out Bougainville become a, a like a, a like an independent state, a newly newly independent state. And East Timor is another example. Um, they're being you know, screwed over by Australia. To no end, and all of their their um, natural uh, gas reserves have been stolen from them, and we absolutely have to reverse that. And they're facing trouble when their gas res- reserves run out. Like, how are they going to fund their society and transition to other industries? We need to help them with that. So, I think that this is really what we need to focus on. We we can't just think that everything is directed towards the single goal of a giant military conflict with China which is suicidal on the one hand, and also just a colossal waste of resources on the other. We need to help these communities in our region and we need to be a good neighbour, a good friend to these, to these countries. And we're being, frankly, we're kind of being dicks at the moment. Yeah, I, I really think that we would live in a much safer, uh, more prosperous and a more sustainable world if we just got on with our neighbours and help them out rather than obsess relentlessly with a gigantic conflict which would just be terrible for everybody involved. This drive for war is coming on at the backs of a a budget crisis. They're saying, oh no, we need to repay the debt that we've we've created during COVID and that that means the inevitable cutting of services and um, paring back wages and like, there, there is a, a finite amount of money, apparently, for all of these things. But when it comes to war, there's an unlimited amount of money. Tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, like these $60 billion nuclear submarines. Like this, this money comes from nowhere. They just invented it. And you know, they don't have to justify the fact that these things, are, are, there's so much money, it would do unbelievable amounts of good if spent in our society. So a socialist... Um, alternative for the drive to war would be to spend the budget that's currently spent on arms dealers and the military on people. There's so many problems that we need to solve. Like there's obviously the transition away from fossil fuels and adaptation to climate change. That's going to take a huge amount of resources and education and health. We've been smashed by COVID pandemic. So we need to rebuild our hospitals and to reorganise them in a way that is resilient for future pandemics. And we need to retrain people in our society for the jobs of the future, these jobs that we'll we'll have to have in order to deal with all of these problems as they're compounded. And where is this money coming from? The government and the, the, well, the media class of the country just agrees that, you know, oh, Ordinary people are going to have to pay for this themselves. They're just going to have to work something out. And I, I absolutely reject this. This is a social... They, these are all social issues that we can respond to collectively with the resources of our society. We do have those resources. We're a rich country. And instead of deciding that we're going to um, divert all of the money, all of the, the work and the resources in order to, to fight some imaginary conflict with China... We should spend it on the people and creating a society that's going to be sustainable in the future.